Morning all, I'd like to show you a very interesting game from the British Chess Championship. In round 9, Grandmaster Christopher Ward, federated 2432, is playing Jasper Tambini, rated just 1979, so an under 2000 rating with no title. Christopher Ward, as well as being a GM, is a chess coach and author. He won the British Chess Championship in 1996 earning the GM title in the process. is the author of two well-received books on a variation of the Sicilian Defence, The Sicilian Dragon, and, and also other books on chess. He's the author of the book Starting Out in Rook Endings, published by Everyman Chess. He's also authored It's Your Move series, the most challenging being the third book, It's Your Move Tough Puzzles, which was published by Everyman Chess. Chris Ward teaches chess to many different schools and also has been involved as being a dance teacher, salsa dancing, I believe. So Jasper Tambini, his opponent, although a very low FIDE rating at, at the time, at this time, he has been actually quite good on the ECF rating scale. He was actually over 200 uh, a while back, and that's quite an achievement for most club players. Most club players will never reach over 200 ECF. But there is a disparity between the local chess federation ratings and FIDE ratings. However, a huge rating FIDE gap here and title gap. Let's see what happened in this game. D4 from Chris, D5, and we see the Queen's Gambit declined. And now C takes D5. And it so happens, uh, Chris, Chris Ward's uh, games in the Queen's Gambit in this variation I'd actually uh, done an article about the Queen's Gambit and used some of his games as a reference point. Very key uh, positional strategies, uh, very aggressive ideas of White potentially castling Queenside in this variation. So will White be aiming to castle Queenside? Bishop g5, Bishop e7, we see e3, Knight bd7. And now a clue that maybe White's interested in a hack and slay game. Queen c2 has the intention potentially to castle queenside. So there are other ways of more classically playing uh, the position of course. White could just have um, played knight f3, bishop d3 and later played for what's known as a minority attack. Uh, just, just to show you an example, knight f3, bishop d3 and later the minority attack plan aims to create structural damage like this. It's a minority of pawns against this majority here to make this pawn backward and this pawn isolated. That's the key, you know, the stereotypical plan we'd ex expect. But this is a more aggressive plan, this queen c2, to castle queen side potentially. So it's more about king safety. c6, bishop d3. Now black does castle for, for the moment, knight f3, h6, bishop f4, rook e8 is played here. And now Chris plays h3. So, okay, it means this bishop's given an escape square back in case knight h5 becomes possible. It also deprives black the g4 square. Black just plays for the moment knight f8. And now white does castle queen side. And it's this kind of uh, position which, which does mean, you know, with the kings on the other side of each other, it's a very exciting game usually. And white's really trying to open up lines against the black king, and black's trying to generate some counterplay. But the key positional point is that sometimes when black plays for stuff like b5, b4, it's the c5 square on this semi open file which can often be used strategically for white to get, for example, a knight outpost on c5. And this is was the basis of some instructive articles I'd written years ago on the Barnet site. As a variation of the Queen's Gambit decline, it's more than just going for the king here. It's this c5 and the c5 square, kind of provoking black to go for white's king and create some weaknesses in the pro in the process. So we see knight e6, bishop e5, and now b5 indeed. So the idea here, you know, of b4, knight a4, black has to be wary of that c5 square. We see king b1 and now a5, so black's really going for the king it seems. And so is white now, g4, a very exciting scenario, opposite side castling. Knight d7 and now just knight e2, so not minding uh, having pawns doubled. Now knight e2 does mean that potentially knight c1 to b3 to c5 is still on the cards, but also maybe the knight will swing over here or even knight f4. 
Let's see, queen b6, h4, trying to open up lines perhaps with g5 soon, a4, g5, and black tries to keep things closed with h5. And it's here that Chris plays this check. Okay, and the king goes to h8. And now a very aggressive move, which is actually the top engine move. So it's a very, very powerful tactical move, which seems to be one of the top engine moves anyway. But there's another good move as well. But it's a bishop g6. So double attacking these two pawns, bishop sacrifice. Does black want to take this bishop? Will black get slaughtered? Let's have a quick look. If black takes the bishop, queen takes g6. Now what is white actually threatening? Check, king moves, taking here with check. Those are the key threats, as well as queen takes h5 and g6. So there's quite a number of threats here. And it's, it's actually technically, it seems, busted for black. For example, knight d f8, we can take the rook. Uh, let's try bishop b4. Well, we can still just take the rook. And this is an advantage why we can take here. So you might wonder, OK, can, cannot black just uh, defend this uh, position? Let's have a look. Instead of bishop b4, uh, so the rook and the knight are attacked here. Let's go with knight c7. We just play queen takes g7, mate. So there's not too many choices. If we play knight takes e5, we just take here. And then we can take on h5. Whoa, pardon me. What's happened here? Queen takes h5. Knight takes e5, and again white's massively up. So this this is really really dangerous if black did take. So he wisely he just went a pawn down with rook f8. So he offers that h5 pawn. Chris takes it, and white's white's slightly better of course after taking it. But it's a little bit of misplacement, and it's getting in the way of opening up the lines. There's quite a way off to open lines now. At least the queen isn't around the king. That's the key thing. But black now is threatening after b4, menacing b3. OK, does this need to be stopped with white playing b3? Well, actually, Chris goes for queen f5. The threat, bishop takes f7, clearly. OK, so what can black do here? Well, black actually plays knight d8, kicking the queen back, goes back to d3 which might be an unfortunate square actually. Maybe queen f4 is better as an alternative. Or even knight f4. And it's, it's a bit tricky though, this position with the queen exposed like this. You'd think black has some resources now with the queen a little bit exposed. But it should be okay for white, but it's tricky, becoming a bit trickier. But this queen d3 retreat means that now black can attack the queen with bishop a6. We see queen d2. And now bishop c4, this bishop's really uh, providing maybe more support for b3 at some point. Knight c1, trying to defend the position, keeping things secure, the a2. It looks as though there's no real problem for the moment. Because if black plays b3, we can just keep things closed, surely, with a3. If black plays a3, we just keep things closed keep things closed with b3. So if a3 and b3 are not available, what is black actually threatening? So black plays knight e6. We see bishop g4. And now white, if given time, if white's given time, maybe knight d3, for example, putting pressure on b4 at some point, or knight f4 later, or knight e2. Again, just, just to do something aggressive with these knights at some point, if black's not doing anything. For the moment though, rook fb8. And it looks quite impressive that actually there's quite a few attacking resources. But the lines need to be opened, surely. Because these two pawns are actually getting in the way of any pressure, any significant concrete threats are stopped by these two pawns. But this is an exchange sacrifice. This last move is offering an exchange sacrifice as well. Was this actually sound? Let's have a quick look, rewind that. An engine suggestion is that black is not doing too badly here, not that badly anyway. Maybe king g8. If we try h5, maybe black can just play knight takes g5, so it's not that easy to open the lines. So black offered the exchange, interestingly, uh, which was taken, and now we see 
a move which maybe does give black an open line to work with. Maybe this wasn't strictly necessary, but white actually played b3. Now it looks as though it should be absolutely safe, but in theory, uh, potentially this a file is a file which black didn't have. If white had played without b3, for example, knight d3, I think this is also advantageous for white without giving black any files. These these two pawns are really protecting the white king here in this kind of position. Maybe like rook c1 and maybe prepare something later for b3. As soon as you know black plays b3, we just play a3. It doesn't seem to be too too many significant threats. But anyway, Chris played this move b3, and it doesn't look concretely as though black should be able to exploit this. But black takes on a b anyway. A takes, and now this this requires some courage. I think black actually just left the bishop there. He doesn't want to get in the way of his potential a file attacks. He plays c five, offering a whole piece sacrifice. Can this be taken? If taking here, d takes c four, and it does look quite dangerous. But of course, you know, with engine defense, actually, it looks as though this should be okay for white, but it looks a little bit more dangerous than before. That these pawns are really quite a menace, and this a file is of great concern. But in theory, in theory, black is doing um, very badly here actually because white's material up, and white should be able to just just to explore this a little bit more. White should be able to be okay here, as maybe resources like this coming in. But anyway. That bishop isn't actually taken here. Chris proceeds with g6, and we see rook a8. So this theoretical a file, leaving this piece here, not blocking in its pieces, is is very optimistic. Maybe we can describe this as optimistic chess. But optimistic chess is often very good for bullet and blitz. Can it really work on a one-day game? Can this kind of optimism really work? But on the other hand, black's pieces, you know, if they're not on attacking uh, places, how can how can any uh, attack hope to be uh, successful here? Black needs to play optimistically here, because otherwise he is worse. So he's leaving that bishop, and it's ignored again. Knight g5. White is going for black's king, and we see queen a6. So there's a concrete threat now of. Uh, mating in seven actually with check here, bringing in the other row, and this would be a, a mate in seven if white's not careful. So queen b2, and here black goes all in with bishop takes b3. So he's relying on these pawns to be attacking resources now. Kasparov has said that pawns around the king are often worth pieces, like they're often acting as attacking pieces. Is that the case here? Knight takes b3, c4. So materially, White is in this position, uh, not only a rook up, but also okay on pieces. It's actually just well, it's a rook up really, isn't it? If we count the minor pieces, it's three minor pieces each. But White has an extra rook, and after G takes F7, is offering the knight, okay, but is is now undermining this diagonal. Black doesn't want to open up this h file, be like mating immediately with that pawn on f7. Uh, so now after c takes, again, white remains a rook up, basically two minor pieces each. White has two rooks, black has one rook. We see now queen c4. Now there's some dangers here in this position. If we were playing white, maybe some of us, especially in blitz, would blunder here horrifically. It's quite easy to blunder because these these two pawns are quite menacing, attacking uh, resources in their own right, and that is demonstrated. For example, if we played rook c1, it's a disaster. Check, and you see this pawn is a menace, and this file is now a menace, and white would have to give up the rook, and it wouldn't end there. Because there's check here, winning the queen. So you can see you can go very, very badly wrong in this position if rook c1 is played. Okay, what is black actually threatening? If black's given the chance, then rook a2 is a very, very serious threat to win the queen. Now in this position, Chris actually played queen c1. And now the optimistic play, shall we say, in inverted commas of black, 
And remember, he's more than 400 points less on FIDE rating scale. Can you see what Black played here? I'm going to flip the board. So Black to play, if I give you 10 seconds starting from now, what would you play as Black? Okay, Black played Rook A1 check. Any idea? Now, it's a very, very dangerous idea. Um, if takes, then that's really, really bad. It's a mating four check. And you know, if the king moves anywhere, unless it wants to delay it with giving putting the queen in front, but it's going to be mates here. So Chris is forced to play king b2. But now we see check, king b1. And this what was should have been just a theoretical uh file is actually very practical here. After queen a6, this not only stops queen c8 here, it means you know rook a1 and queen a3 is on the cards. This is a very, very difficult to parry. White tries in this position to play f8 check, giving him knight f7, which looks quite dangerous. Black takes check. Okay, and now we can um, go king g8, and maybe that's not entirely clear that. Uh, this this is still winning uh, for black it seems, but black wisely perhaps goes king h7, and white's you know running out of checks. He hasn't got queen c2 as a check square, so he plays knight g5 check, king g6, and now bishop f5 check. And again, it's not entirely clear that you know this can actually be taken, but maybe there's another check here e4, but. Um, you know, white is running out of checks here, but uh, black didn't go in for this. He just played king f6, and here, Grandmaster Chris Ward resigned. He's really run out of checks. Let's flip the board again. It's it's really quite shocking. This scalp, it's such a huge rating difference from a player which you know usually you wouldn't see players under 2,000 in the British Championship. Um, there are qualification procedures, but uh, Jasper must have qualified for this tournament. And this is a gigantic scalp to beat a former British champion. But let's have a look, you know, earlier at the critical moment to see could White have really gone out of this? Because it seemed quite dangerous in this position. Frankly, it seemed dangerous. If Rook C1 and Queen C1, how does White actually play this? I think. Something about chess, I think we need to all bear in mind, is that sometimes dynamic play, what we consider in inverted commas dynamic play, is actually the safest play in many situations. And here, the safest way, it seems, one of the safest ways to extinguish Black's counterplay, and this might not be the top engine move, certainly it isn't the top engine move, but it's a strong move nevertheless. It's one of the strongest moves. I'll go on to the engine moves later. But this is a very dynamic try because it will extinguish the flames of the A file. If rook a2 here, then we can sacrifice the queen. And say it's taken here, king takes b2. Not, by the way, rook takes b2 because this would allow queen d3 check with a draw by perpetual. These pesky pawns are keeping the draw here intact. But king takes b2. And this will present black with some problems. Because it's quite precarious here. This knight's loose. This pawn's very dangerous. What does black do here? Black actually technically is busted here. If he tries queen a6, just let's just put that into to, to protect c8. In this position, again, we need an accurate move actually, because black is threatening queen a2 mate. So rook a1, queen b7. Okay, a8 and c8 are fended off, and d7 is protected. But here, actually, bishop takes d7, and you see that white's getting a bit more material here. Black cannot take this. If queen takes d7, then it's black's king's safety, which is questioned. Black is actually getting mated here. 
So you see that sometimes in a critical position, a dynamic move is often the only move. So this dynamic approach is actually the safest approach here. What else can black do if he doesn't take on b2 here? If he plays this, then white can wriggle out now with queen takes b3, which seems very, very scary indeed. But let's rule out check, just king b2 and, and we're as safe as houses. So that should be okay. If we if black takes this rook, there's no threat on mate on, on a2. So bishop takes d7 and white's massively up. White's again threatening rook c8. So this was the dynamic course of action to just extinguish the a file and try and use the c file and try and get to black's king. Um, let's have a look at other alternatives here in this critical position. So on queen a6, uh, we saw rook a1. Now what if, okay, let's put in, let's try queen b5. Bishop takes d7, queen takes d7. Here things are trickier, we haven't got any any access to the back row, but it should still be better for white. King takes b3, a bit greedy for the king to do this. But, you know, white has a material advantage. The bishop can't take without allowing the queening. Let's go with bishop f8. And now white goes for that back row with rook a2. So rook a8, the serious threat. Black tries to stop rook a8. A rook a5 on d5. White should be better here now if something like this. Rook c c5 just to win d5. And you can see that, okay, there's a bit of fight left. It's two rooks against the queen here, but this is obviously much better than the game. Okay, so in the game, it, it was just a total disaster, but it was a little bit of a tricky position. Now, I did mention I'd show you the, the top way out of this position, the top way out of this position, the dangers here, like rook a2. Um, Black's numerous threats here. Maybe even knight b6 is, is getting dangerous as well for knight a4. <laughs> so actually, uh, white can actually use apparently f8 just to give this knight f7. So whatever way black takes, well, if rook takes, then bishop takes d7. That's uh, clear enough. I think there's, there's nothing going on there. So if black doesn't want to lose the knight, uh, let's go with knight takes, check. And the point is here that if king g8, then knight e5 check wins the queen. So knight takes e6, we can take the queen, and that's all over. And the point now is that now we have bishop f5 check, and we can come and attack the queen with either knight e5 or even in this position I think bishop d3 is good as well but just knight e5 as well here attacking the queen and this should be okay you know white's doing fantastically well so some forcing moves to just evict that queen basically and it's necessary it seems to give up that pawn that's a that's the safest it turns out that giving up the pawn is the safest way uh, to win this position. There is actually also, even in this line though, there's a dynamic thing that black can try, which is bishop takes f8, actually giving up the knight on purpose. And white shouldn't take this knight, otherwise again, rook a2, and it's pretty scary. What is white doing here? It's actually dead equal now. For example, like this. And we get this perpetual check situation. If king here, then check. So we're getting just perpetual checks uh, with this queen a6. But the point in this line, if black gives up the knight, white actually should just use the check here, not take the knight, but use the check. So if king j8, we win the queen with knight e5 or knight d6. So get the king's h7 check, and now finally white can serve this eviction notice to the queen. And this should be safe enough now after queen c3 rook d2. Black's attack should be at an end here. If rook a2 we can now take on c3. For example rook a2 we can take on c3 and then take on a2. 
so that should spell the end of Black's attack. But you know, Black wasn't without chances. It has to be said, it, it's some scary opportunities afforded by these two pawns in this file. But maybe it shows, you know, even even in, in one day games, you know, optimism can sometimes pay huge dividends. That Black um, got this attacking these attacking resources around the king, and it's just one blunder. It just shows that one blunder like this. And it can be all over, you know, forcing moves, rook a1 check, make an appearance. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.